It's all right, son. Go ahead and cry. Look, I don't care that She-Hulk's already finished. I've been wanting to talk about this goddamn movie forever, so I'm making a video, damn it. So, today we're talking about Ang Lee's Hulk. Look, I'm sure you're familiar with essays on YouTube pumping out revisionist history, where they take a bad movie and claim that it's some kind of masterpiece. And look, I have no intention- Look, fuck it, that's exactly what I'm doing. Dude, Hulk slaps. This movie is far more narratively rich and thought-provoking than anything that's come out of the genre in the last 10 years. Look, I know that's a big claim to make, but hear me out before you crucify me in the comments. From the outset, Hulk may look like a bad movie. The masses have told us that it's slow. The editing is weird, the CGI is bad, and look, I'm not here to dispute the CG or some editing choices, but this is a great movie. There's some truly beautiful sequences in this movie. How Ang Lee managed to slip whatever this artistic shot is into a superhero blockbuster is beyond me. There's some seriously tender moments as well, quiet parts where we explore the micro as well as the macro, where we feel the wind with the Hulk as he leaps through the air, where he takes in his childhood home before it's blown to smithereens. The movie is a back and forth of bombastic action and quiet introspective moments that dive into the Hulk's psyche. Sure, this is perfectly natural for a movie of weight to do, to have sincerity as well as enjoyment. I think where people usually take issue is the editing. Look, this is something that has to be discussed, we have to get this out of the way. Whenever people talk about the 2003 Hulk movie, it's always, but come on bro, the comic book transitions. Shit's whack. And look, I kind of agree. I don't really like it. To me, it conflicts with the very serious subject matter of the movie. Those themes we'll get into soon. The editing is purposeful though, of course, in effort to make it feel more like a comic book, but it's also aggressive to the point where it takes you out of the movie. It breaks verisimilitude. As discussed in other videos, this is the internal truth of the movie, the rules of the movie. And when you have a serious psychological drama edited like a kid's cartoon, it does create some tonal dissonance. That being said, I do think the use of the comic book style transitions aids the movie in that it highlights the more dramatic scenes that do get played straight, that are shot traditionally. The emotion almost feels heightened in these simple back and forths because it's Lee essentially declaring this scene must be taken seriously. It's the director flexing his muscles, giving us creative action that is shot with clarity, montages and sequences that captivate. Seriously, that opening 10 minutes is just peak cinema. He's doing everything on purpose. There's no accidents here, focusing on the micro as well as the macro. Ang Lee's Hulk is something more akin to a Terrence Malick movie than it is a superhero action adventure. They took Ang Lee, Crouching Tiger Hidden Dragon Ang Lee, Life of Pi Ang Lee, and gave him a superhero movie. He took a superhero known for destruction and rampage and created something far more sincere and introspective than anything we've seen from the genre now. He applied his art house perspective to tell a tale of fathers and sons, childhood trauma, domestic violence, and the repercussions of those themes. What it results in is a story that, on the surface, appears to be a tale of a big green guy with daddy issues, but fundamentally harkens back to the ideas of masculinity, femininity, rage, aggression, and trauma that define the character. It's a funny thing, I wanted to get a come. I always liked Jekyll and Hyde, and I always liked the Frankenstein movie, the old one with Karloff. It's alive. Oh, it's alive. It's alive, it's alive. And in the Frankenstein movie, I always felt the monster is really the good guy. He didn't want to hurt anybody. All those idiots with torches were always chasing him up and down the hills. So I thought it would be fun to get a monster who was really a good guy. And to take a, a leaf from the Jekyll and Hyde thing, where he could change from a normal person into the monster. And I, I did the Hulk. Stanley, when creating the Hulk, wanted a fusion of Jekyll and Hyde as well as Frankenstein, both stories that have come to heavily inform the character. But after all, that's the problem of civilized man's soul, isn't it? That the good and evil in it are constantly fighting one another? The themes of those stories Ang Lee leaned on heavy here. Well, what are those themes? Who is Bruce Banner as a character, and in what way did those monster icons inspire him? Well, let's talk about that. At the core of the Frankenstein story is a monster that wasn't asked to be created. 
we see what happens when man takes the power of God, so to speak, into his own hands. Have you never wanted to do anything that was dangerous? Where should we be if nobody tried to find out what lies beyond? I tried to improve on the limits in myself. You never wanted to look beyond the clouds and the stars? To improve on nature, my nature, knowledge of oneself. It's the only path to the truth that give men the power to go beyond God's boundaries. Frankenstein is a story of life being created without a mother, if anything highlighting the essential essence of the feminine, the kindness, compassion and care you get with the mother. Something Frankenstein doesn't receive from his father in the slightest, and something Bruce doesn't receive either. Don't trust me! Maybe once you were my father, but you're not now and you never will be. The Hulk is an incredibly fascinating character, he's more than just a power fantasy. Lee leaned into that here, telling a tale more akin to a traditional monster movie than a superhero blockbuster, tackling those essential themes in the Frankenstein story like masculinity, but also femininity, and the importance of either. This is explored through Bruce's many relationships in the movie, his relationship with his father being the most prominent, but also with Betty. At the centre of this movie is a tale of fathers and sons, abuse and neglect. Bruce throughout the movie is consistently dealing with his bottled up rage, he's pushed it down, and continues to push it down unwilling to admit that he has a monster lurking within. Like us all, we have an aggressive side, but Bruce doesn't want to acknowledge this side of himself, his reasoning being his father, David. What are you afraid that I'll see? Bruce at a young age has seen his father's aggression and associated that to something negative. The abuse and ultimate death of his mother. This traumatic experience has pushed him away from displaying aggression, bottling it up, so much so that he's disassociated from those memories. Oh, some more repressed memories. Bruce is so against violence that he's become rather meek and hard to read, distant and isolated. Why do you always come back to this? Don't know. Guess I figure there's more to you than you like to show. Unwilling to acknowledge the part of himself that he doesn't want to unleash, the part of himself he views is his father, the Hulk. You must know. You may not want to believe it, but I can see it in your eyes. This is supported by the recurring motif of the door, representing David's domestic abuse, but most importantly, his aggression. The aggression Banner doesn't want to acknowledge is within himself, the Hulk. This door motif is so potent that when the Hulk first unleashes himself across the labs, one of the first things he destroys is a door, almost to say, this is the part of me I have buried, finally coming out. And when Bruce first comes face to face with his father as the Hulk, David emerges out of a door, but in a caring way. Now this is a little odd. Why have such a tender scene attached to a motif that represents such buried rage? Well that's because the door doesn't represent Bruce's rage at all, it represents his father, David. Part of most men's existence is facing the duality of their fathers, the harsh and the unforgiving, but also the loving and caring. In this scene, we see that on full display, Bruce, the Hulk, getting an inch of that benevolence, that care and kindness, reminding him of the love he got as a child. But Bruce, the Hulk, understands there is also the ogre in his father, the ogre he's let himself become by giving in to his aggression, his rage, and so he storms off. The relationship established between Bruce and David anchors this movie, whilst there's some fun scenes, like a surprising amount of nut shots for some reason. Yeah! Okay, what's what's going on here? Oh, okay, all right. What keeps this movie chugging along is Lee going back to the father and son dynamic in Frankenstein and using that as the anchor from which everything unravels. The Hulk is a manifestation of Bruce's dormant aggression waiting to be released, but also represents part of his father, not just literally being a product of a science experiment, being half of his genes, but also metaphorically as Bruce faces the duality of his father and the door motif is the gateway to exploring his traumatic past. The idea of overcoming the father is a prevalent part of a lot of monster stories, to overcome the cool creator that birthed such a creature, the monster that never asked to be made. But to understand the monster, you first have to understand the creator. Who is David? Well, based off what we can see in the movie, Nolte's David is a broken man. 
He's not a mustache twirling villain, he's just a narcissist that has fallen so far from the life of achievement he was after. All top secret, they put me away for 30 years. 30 years. When we meet him in the present, he's a janitor. Not to knock janitors, but typically it's seen as an invisible job, something without recognition or praise. The opposite of David's life as a scientist, on a breakthrough that would revolutionise regenerative healing and make him a world-renowned scientist. When David first sees what Bruce has become, he sees the potential of his power and the potential to facilitate his goals of playing with God. I gave you life. Now you must give it back to me. And this, this is ultimately where David as a character comes undone. The man is a narcissist through and through. He doesn't see Bruce, not really. He just sees how he can serve him. I didn't come here to see you. I came here to see my son, my real son. Much like the Frankenstein story, the monster only serves the doctor in the way that enriches his ego. The fact that the man was able to create life, that he was able to play God, and one. Stop! Stop! What? Stop! What? Think about all those men out there in their uniforms. And if you talk like that, people call you crazy. Well, if I could discover just one of these things, what eternity is, for example, I wouldn't care if they did think I was crazy. David is no different. His philosophy to play God absolves him of conflict. He sees everything as energy to play with. You see, I can partake with the essences of all things. Do you really believe that I am separate from you? This is even supported by what he says, or more importantly, how he says things. To someone willing to acknowledge their wrongdoings, they'd say they accidentally killed their wife. But this is what David says. It was as if she and the knife merged. David has rejected any need for self-reflection. I took everything that was dear to me and transformed it into nothing more than a memory. His narcissism devours those around him. Narcissists tend to feed off others, and we see that here. That's right. Keep fighting. The more you fight, the more of you I take. It being somewhat fitting that he then becomes a villain called the Absorbing Man. Yes. David's focus on his pursuits, so much so that he doesn't see people as people, just a transaction. And this isn't just the case for David, it's the same for Thunderbolt Ross as well. Both Betty and Bruce dealing with a similar type of father, a father of neglect. Fathers that saw their children not for who they were, but as a means to an end. I think I was hoping that maybe this time you just honestly wanted to see me again. Within Bruce's psyche is a duality, one of a meek, ill-willed man. Puny human. And that of the Hulk, representing his rage, a part of himself he's associated with his father and thus he's scared to tap into. The only thing that can combat the rage, or the radically masculine, the only thing that can calm him down is the feminine, love. We see a glimpse of the feminine in Bruce's memories, his mother providing a calming presence. In the present, this presence is Betty, allowing Bruce to be saved. You know what's beyond your boundaries? Other people. All you've given Bruce is fear. You found me. You weren't that hard to find. Yes, I was. Now Bruce goes a step beyond having the feminine just balance out his aggression, having it quench his anger. It's Bruce's ultimate acknowledgement of his duality that allows him to own the Hulk by the movie's end, making the two one in the same and becoming a more balanced individual. In relinquishing the part of himself he doesn't like, he now is able to incorporate it into his being, to be in control of his two sides. This movie could have easily had David and Bruce land in a pack city and have the stakes come from endangered lives, had the finale deliver the very specific superhero flair we've grown accustomed to in the third acts of these movies. But this isn't that kind of movie. What matters to this movie is this, relationship. And that's all we need. We don't need fireballs and explosions, just the back and forth of two characters and their differing worldviews. It really speaks to where the focus lied, 
on the characters and themes, focusing on the strength of an art house director and what he does best, tales of broken people. David is just as broken and as traumatized as Bruce, jaded from a world that devoured him and like tales of old, part of the story of becoming a man is rescuing your father from the belly of the whale. Hulk transcends his father's abuse, he transcends his aggression by folding it into his personality instead of shutting it out, becoming one with the Hulk. Perhaps it's better to be dangerous and in control of that power rather than to say you're not dangerous at all. Perhaps it's better not to shut it out, but to make it one with yourself. Perhaps that's what makes someone truly moral, to acknowledge the many sides of yourself, the kind and the aggressive, and to fold it into one being. People who are very well behaved um, are more in tune with that than people who aren't, because people who manage to, to conduct themselves in society in a very well behaved manner uh, are always keeping those things in check. So I think sometimes those people have a better understanding of that inner Hulk than people who just fly off the handle whenever they feel like it. The Hulk, Bruce, becomes his best self when he folds these elements into one, when he goes on the journey of becoming more than the sum of his parts, to acknowledge his many facets and come out the other side a new man. Perhaps facing the father is a requirement to become a man, to acknowledge a more complex worldview. A great example of this might be the Egyptian god Horus, as he once faced his uncle Seth. For all intents and purposes, he's basically the precursor to Satan. However, in facing him, he lost an eye, because you don't escape malevolence and evil without losing a part of yourself. That's the cost of facing evil. Essentially, part of becoming something else is sacrificing what you once were. But what is this story trying to teach? Well, the optimistic truth of it is that in facing evil, which for most kids in abusive household might be their father, Will you come out the other side a better and stronger person, opening yourself up to your maximal potential? That in facing the worst evil you could imagine, in your world of course, that might be your father, you have come out the other side stronger, wiser, and a better version of yourself than if you had not. Is this a bit too deep? Am I rattling on right now? Perhaps. Alright. Look, I know you guys came for some video where I talked about how awesome this movie is, where I talk about the clarity in the action, the amazing abstract borderline surrealist sequences. Seriously, look at that. That's in a movie. A blockbuster movie. But ultimately, these ideas, this is the meat of the movie and why I love it so much. Obviously, Elfman's theme is just brilliant. It evokes a melancholy feeling that just gets me going. Ang Lee obviously had a lot of fun making this. What's my point? One, he looks like a toad of a man. And two, we should move towards incorporating our Hulk instead of pretending it doesn't exist. Was this video a little all over the place? I don't know. I don't care. Frankly, regardless, I genuinely believe that audiences weren't ready for a movie this thought-provoking in 2003, especially following something as kinetic and as visceral as the Spider-Man movie that only came out one year before it. And look, I'm not trying to say it's a Terrence Malick movie, it's got comic sense font for Christ's sake. All I'm saying is it's far better than we remember, far better than we want to give it credit for, far better than the empty, vapious blockbusters we're given today. Hey guys, I hope you liked the video. So as some of you may know, I launched my Patreon recently. I want to thank my Illuminati members for making this video possible this quickly. A huge thanks to Axis, GBC, Carson, Caleb, Lance, Kai, Draco, a dude from Krypton, Pixel Lander, ScreenSpark, and Lidge F07. I'm not sure how to pronounce that. You guys have been my biggest backers and you're the reason a video like this can be made. And for you guys specifically, you can now go onto my Patreon and decide the direction of this channel. I'm going to put up a poll with two videos and you can decide which one gets posted next. With that being said, I hope everyone enjoyed the video and I will see you guys in the next one. Ciao.